As I said a while ago, we have uh, great interest in this information session. We have got people who have come from all over Australia, so we do want to maximise or optimise, I should say, the use of our time. I also said a while ago that the Rural Health Alliance, for which I work, is very pleased to have a good relationship with the national data agencies. I want to um, just repeat that because, of course, data and evidence is of critical importance to us, as you would understand, given the task we have. If you're not sure what the tasks the Rural Health Alliance does have, do look at our website, which is a wonderfully maintained and, influ and informational website. We have a very particular close and working relationship with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Uh, we, we meet every quarter formally with them. They're, they're, they're terrific meetings. I'd have to say that um, they tend to be characterised by Andrew Phillips, who of course is our data person, talking mainly with his ex-colleagues at the Institute and ignoring me because they know that I don't understand anything. But nevertheless, the relationship is very important to us and very valuable, so I do want to acknowledge that once more. And representing the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare today is, uh, I've got to give his surname, David, David Whitelaw, who attends those quarterly meetings with the Rural Health Alliance. So please welcome David Whitelaw. So, good morning. Um, allow me to introduce myself. As Gordon said, my name is David Whitelaw. Um, I'm actually the statistical advisor for the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Uh, but every now and again, they actually let me out so that I can interact with real people. So this is one of my opportunities. So I thought I would start my 15 minute session, um, section by talking about um, what the Institute is and what we actually do. Um, so we're a major national agency set up by the Australian Government to provide reliable, regular and relevant information and statistics on Australia's health and welfare. So our aim is to improve health and wellbeing of Australians through better health and welfare information and statistics. And so we do this by producing uh, reports uh, and other information products on key health and welfare issues in Australia. So what this means is we're actually a consumer of tools like uh, the modified Monash model. We use them to run analyses uh, to report on health and welfare um, across the country. So an example of the sort of thing that we do is that we're the data custodian for the National Health Workforce data set. So this is a data set that contains information on the registered National Health Workforce and we use this um, to analyse and report on what's going on. So for example, uh, we have a, rec a recently released product, Australia's Registered Health Workforce by Location, which consists of interactive data tables on the web. So you can split up by uh, profession and you can split it up by geography, such as state um, and primary health network and SA3, uh, and look at numbers, um, FTEs, those sorts of things. So that, they're the sorts of things that we do. Okay, so the modified Bonash model has already been uh, amply uh, described. What I'm going to do is go through and, and not describe it again, but pick out bits that are, that are pertinent to the way that the Institute um, will use the modified Monash. Um, for starters, uh, it's been designed um, to assist with effectively targeted in incentives. So what it's aimed to do is create regions um, that are homogeneous, that is, that are the same in relation to attracting GPs um, to the area. Um, and it's done this by further disaggregating inner and outer regional remoteness areas. Now, one of the things that um, I'll note is that by aggregating inner, inner, region, inner and outer regional and then splitting those out into separate groups, um, for those groups, it's taken the emphasis off distance to larger centres and placed the emphasis on distance to the closer centre and how big that closer centre is. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing, it's just a change in the impact it's going to have on any analysis we do using the modified Monash. So obviously, modified Monash is going to be very useful for reporting on programs that use uh, that model in an effort to improve um, delivery of services. Um, there are potentially other uses, 
uh, where the topic of study has similar properties um, to the difficulty in attracting uh, GPs. Now, the first thing that we really need to talk about um, from an institute point of view is the ability to use the modified Monash. Where we stand at uh, so the mod, the mod, where we stand at the present, the modified Monash requires data at the SA1 level. It's been built using SA1s, and the correspondence that exists at the moment is from SA1 um, to the modified Monash regions. Now, this, the reason that we can't at the moment use broader levels is because we end up with, if we use SA2, let's say, or postcode, we end up with a case where we have a one-to-many situation. So, for example, with SA2s, only 82% of SA2s map to a single modified monitor region. 15% uh, map to two. Now, where that leaves you as an analyst is not sure how to break up um, your population. I have my records, I have my people or my practices, and I know which SA2 they belong to, but which modified Monash region do I correspond them to? Now, um, I'm sure that my colleagues at the ABS are looking at coming up with correspondences for these broader levels, um, as we have for broad levels to things like remoteness areas, which don't map perfectly. Um, and I'm going to be very interested to see the quality and, and how well we can map from broader areas. Now, the reason that this matters is because SA1 level data is quite rare on administrative data. It's slightly more common on registers um, and survey data. Um, but for example, after a quick overview of data sets that the Institute holds that has uh, geographical data on it, 12% can map to modified Monash as we stand currently. 8% might be able to and 80% can't. Now, those 12% that can map, all of them have what's known as geocode at the finest level. Geocode is actually latitude and longitude. So you can locate the practice or the person to a point on the map. Now, the 8% that might be able to, the reason that, we, that I'm saying that we might be able to is because we've got address information. Now, theoretically, address information can map to a geo a geocode, a latitude and longitude, which then you can build up to an SA1. But often in practice, that mapping is difficult. Take, for example, administrative data. Administrative data, on the whole, is collected to deliver a service or program. So if you're interested in the person's location so that you can send them a reminder or send them a bill and get paid, then a post office box address is perfectly acceptable for what you want to use it for. If you are wanting to use that information to place the person, then a post office box address um, can be very problematic, especially if we're looking at rural um, people, because the post office address might be in the town and they've got that because uh, it's a long way out to the roadside mailbox. So 8% we've got address, um, but we could have problems mapping that through uh, to SA1 and hence modified Monash. Um, and the 80% where we can't, it's broader than SA1. The majority of those are SA2 or postcode. So that's where things stand at the moment. Now, the Institute is always working hard to improve our data. Um, at the moment, we're in some active discussions to try and get fine level geography data. Um, and one pertinent data set uh, that we're talking about at the moment is getting SA1 or finer detail on the National Health Workforce data set. Um, so things will change over time, but at the moment that's where we stand. Okay, now it's not as simple as saying we want fine level geographic data and being able to get it. There are a number of obstacles that we have to overcome. These are things like the uh, data being collected in the first place. Um, Again, especially with administrative data, if there's not a need for that information to be collected to deliver the service, then that's an extra bit of, extra bit of work and we, and we have to encourage people to do that. Another major issue is maintaining confidentiality and privacy. 
if you give me an address or if you give me latitude and longitude, I can turn up on somebody's doorstep. So there are some major issues there concerning privacy, in concerning informed consent, and all of these things that we have to consider before we can run an analysis. There's also the issue of data quality. Address fields are usually free text fields. Now, that works fine if you're sending a letter out. Australia Post is quite good at interpreting things. But if you're trying to do an automated mapping from address through to um, a geocode and hence SA1, then if somebody's called it Blog Street instead of Blogs Crescent, you're going to have a problem. If somebody has used a property name instead of a street address, you're going to have a problem. Uh, another um, data quality issue we have is, and this may shock you, but people lie. <laughs> and people don't lie consistently. So, for example, if you're asking the address of somebody who's, who's turned up to admit illicit drug use, there's going to be a certain level of motivation not to tell you where they live and to make it up. You've also got issues for certain sections of the population, like the homeless, who don't have a street address. So there are data quality issues that we have to overcome as well. And then there's also some issues in terms of the actual mechanism of going from address to location. Um, there are some licensing issues, and currently, if you're wanting to use the national um, address file, um, there are some issues around who you can then share those geocoded ad addresses with, etc. So there's, there's a number of issues to overcome. It's not just saying we want, we want fine level ge geography detail and it happening overnight. Now, we've talked about the ability to use. Next, I'm going to talk about whether we should be using it. Now, from the Institute's point of view, um, the modified Monash model is another tool that we can put in our toolbox when we're considering analysis. When starting an analysis, what we do is we, we approach and say, what is our question, what tools do we have available, and what are the best ones to use? So in considering whether the modified Monash should be used for a given project, there are a number of things that we have to think through. As talked about earlier today, um, the modified Monash is based on proxi proximity to population centres of a given size. Now, it's rare that the analysis we're doing, we're interested in how close are people to population centres of a given, given size. It's not a question we ask. What we're usually using is we're using that as a proxy for something else. So a population centre of a given size is more likely to have certain services, is more likely to have hospital, is more likely to have drug treatment, it's more likely to have homelessness shelters. So we're using that size as a proxy. So what we have to do is we have to consider how good or otherwise that proxy might happen to be. And we have to remember that there's not an, a perfectly mapped correlation. If a town size grows by 100, they're not magically going to get an uh, oncology unit, for example. Even looking at major centres, not every major city has, for example, a, hospital's, a hospital with a burns unit that can handle serious burns. So that proxy is imperfect, and we have to keep that in mind and think about how that's going to impact on the analysis that we're wanting to do. Also we have to keep in, in, to keep in mind is reporting by Modified Monash or any other geography, we run into a couple of uh, issues that we have to um, consider. The first one is aggregation. Now what, we, what we're doing by reporting by area is we're taking a lot of information and we're distilling it down so that we can report it easily and we can report in generalities or in some sort of average. Now we have to be aware in doing this that we lose information. Now in some ways that's a good thing because too much information and you can't digest it easily. But if, for example, um, we, take, we look at this, here is an area. Now if we look at averages, um, average service of, uh, of um, medical staff, it looks across the whole area like we've got pretty good service, we've got pretty good supply happening. But when we disaggregate it and have a look, if this is a large area, what we end up with is we end up with one client who's very well serviced and somebody who, while on average it looks like their needs are being met, maybe thousands of kilometres away. 
So that's again something we have to keep in mind. Now, the modified Monash um, is better in a lot of ways than remoteness area because this sort of issue has been looked at by, by looking at boundary issues and not just picking the town but looking at distance to um, centres. So this has been dealt with to some extent but it's still going to be there and so it's something that we have to consider. The other thing that we have to look at are the boundary issues. If travel across a boundary is easy, then reporting by discrete um, groups can be a bit misleading. So in this example, we look like we've got one person really well serviced and three areas badly serviced. But if these are small um, and it's easy to travel across that, then presenting just by discrete uh, areas is going to mislead us a little bit. And we saw that with one of the maps this morning where you had an area of a much um, higher number for its modified monash butting up to an area um, that had a, a lower classification for modified monash. So they're the sorts of things that we have to consider in light of the question or the analysis that you're wanting to do. In some cases, this won't be a problem. And in other cases, it's really going to impact on how you can interpret results. So I've talked about it being one tool um, in our toolbox of many tools. So I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of the, tool, the sorts of tools that the Institute uses. So one example is drive time. And this is a um, plug-in module for um, GIS software called MapInfo. And what it does is if you give it any two points in Australia, it will calculate the road distance between them and also the travel time. Now, it's reasonably um, complex in terms of it actually takes into account not just what the posted speed limit is, but also road conditions and those sorts of things. It's not complex enough to take into account things like um, during the wet season, roads are totally, are totally unusable. Now, what this sort of tool means is that instead of using the proxy of town size, I can actually use the service that I'm interested in and the actual location. And the location of services is usually reasonably easy to get. We know the address of hospitals. We know the address of um, drug treatment services. On the other end, the location of the people who you're trying to service, that can be a bit trickier. As, as I've said, 8% of our data sets have actual um, geocodes, so we can do it on a person by person. Otherwise, we have to do some sort of aggregation. Uh, but where it's an improvement is that it's to the actual service that we're, that we're interested in. Now, obviously, this tool is not perfect either. For example, we're making assumptions about travel. We're assuming that the people have access to a car and so can, can drive. We're also assuming that they don't have access to, say, a helicopter, at which point their travel time would be a lot less. So we're making some assumptions, and these assumptions we've got to be really careful about when we're looking at certain sections of the population. Um, car access is not ubiquitous across the country. So an example of where we've used this tool is in analysis for access to primary health care relative to need for Indigenous Australians. And that's somewhere where we use drive time to have a look at um, communities' access uh, to healthcare, and that's available on our website. Another tool that we use is to go beyond just classification. So we can break down areas by looking at additional geographic data, things like density and dispersion, whether they're clustered in an area or not, um, the size of the area, and then we can do things like use other data. So, for example, using demographics or socioeconomic information, and we use this to attack the needs end of the equation. Um, as Andrew mentioned um, before the break, it's a difficult thing to do, but when you're looking at service, uh, if we can in involve not just the number of doctors per people, but how healthy that population is and what their needs are, then we can get a much better picture of whether need is being met. Now, the Institute is doing a lot of work in this area at the moment, and we expect to have a number of uh, releases in the first half of next year that are including this extra information. Now, I could uh, talk for an awfully long time about all of the tools. Um, I'm not going to. Basic, 
if nothing else, because uh, I don't want to put you all to sleep. But if I had two messages I want you to take home from my presentation, the first one is that to realise the potential of geospatial analysis, um, we need more detailed geographical information is needed. There's been a real push for this sort of analysis, and especially in a country like Australia that is so spread out and so diverse in terms of conditions, there's a huge wealth of um, potential that's in geospatial analysis. But we need to overcome uh, those barriers that are in the way of having uh, good geography to be able to do this. The second take-home message is that the modified Monash adds another option to consider. Uh, and it looks like it's going to do a really good job um, on a number of things, especially looking at um, the uh, programs and looking at incentive and looking at um, getting the uh, health workforce out into areas. But it's not necessarily a silver bullet. So when approaching an analysis, um, we should also approach with an open mind and look at all of the tools that are available um, so that we choose the right one. Thank you.